Welcome to Ciao Bella, hosted by me, Erica Firpo, a travel journalist based in Rome. Each episode of Ciao Bella, I sit down with Italy's creators, contemporary artists and artisans, designers, culinary experts, heritage brands, and innovative estites, and more who are defining and redefining 21st century Italy. Pull up a chair and join in. Hey, welcome back to Ciao Bella. Today I'm with Coral Sisk, founder of Curious Appetite. She's a friend, a writer. And with Curious Appetite, she has these crazy Epicurious tours in Florence, Bologna, and San Francisco. They're wine adventures, cocktail tours, gourmet tours, and experiences that are also virtual. Um, but what I'm really interested in are the cocktail Ciao. tours. Ciao, Coral. I want to talk to you about cocktails, but you know really what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> yes. I want to talk to you about the Negroni. Um, there's never a time of day, in my opinion, or a time of year when you shouldn't have a Negroni. Brava. Um, and, and now I kind of feel like I should be having one right now as we're talking. I might, I might have to run out the door and grab one. Um, but you know why I want to talk to you about Negroni. It's because you have created this incredible, these incredible tours, these fo- really, really focused tours, in particular one that talks about a pair of TV in Florence. And from what I understand, that's the birthplace of the Negroni. Yes, uh, as it it seems to be. And uh, so I want to first thank you for having me. And um, hello to everyone listening. And thanks for the intro. So yeah, um, I just a little bit of background too, for those um, that are just listening for the first time. Um, I'm an Italian American, and I moved to Um, Florence in 2012 after earning a degree in Italian studies and I have Italian heritage um, through my mother and um, my relatives come from Sicily so I've always had this fascination for Italian culture and I've been passionate about food and drink you know uh, since a very young age and so Italy just made you know sense for me to move to and carve out a career in food and drink so when I moved in 2012 there were a few things that caught my attention immediately. Um, and that's when I started my food blog as well, um, which then um, kind of parlayed into writing for different um, uh, outlets and online magazines. Uh, and one of those things was a Negroni. I was so fascinated by it. I never, I don't believe I had it before. Uh, and it's, um, you know, for, I'm sure many of you know what it is. It's a, a cocktail a vermouth bitter and gin. Well, I have, a, I have a question for you. The first, so, so you moved to Italy and you, the first time you had Negroni was in Italy. What was, um, what was your first reaction? Oh man. Um, well, this is before I kind of got, um, a, a little bit more specific on like what's a, a good and what's a not so good Negroni. But I remember going to one of these like aperitivo bars in the, uh, Piazza San, uh, Santo Spirito, and, you know, I got like my Negroni with, you know, the, the you know, the buffet, the Aperi buffet. And I was like, wow, this is a strong drink. I got a great bang for my buck because, you know, the way they free pour it, you know, it's just like tons of gin. That's the American yeah. in you. <laughs> yeah, I said, exactly. The American in me was like, sweet. Like, <laughs> this is a strong drink and it's kind of bitter. Uh, and I like it because I like bitter things. So funny. I remember the first time I had one, I was with my friend Davide in Venice and it was Halloween. And he was like, like, he's like, there was, you know, there was no celebrating of Halloween, but I had this t-shirt that had a girl wearing glasses. And then I painted glasses on my face and went out with him. And he was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm four eyes. Right. Cause I thought it was really funny. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then, and then, so we, so we go out and he's like, he orders this two Negroni and I'd never had one. I'm like, what is this? And he's like, try it. And I drank it. And just like you in my head, I was like, Oh, this is a great drink. You know, it's, it's completely economical and it has a lot of alcohol in it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, and I remember saying to him, I think I said something like that. And then I was also like, and now I really do have four eyes. Cause I yeah. was so drunk very quickly. <laughs> But, 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 but by the way, that's, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's a very cultured drink and you're not supposed to respond that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially because the Italians and, and alcohol is like this odd subject because on the one hand, Italians drink a lot, but they don't really l- l- drink for the sake of drinking. It's always to go with the food. And, uh, you know, again, Negroni, even though it's like, you know, the wine is made for the food, 
Um, and Negroni, you still have it with food. Um, you rarely would have a Negroni without food unless it's after dinner time. And although traditionally it's consumed as a aperitif and, you know, um, yeah. So it's just like this, this weird thing where you can drink a lot as long as you eat. This is what I've learned about Italian food and drink culture. <laughs> I think, I think that's my rule of thumb for everything at this point. Just eat yeah. a lot. <laughs> now, the Negroni, I, it's, it's interesting. I was telling somebody that I was going to talk to you, a friend of mine in Milan, that we were going to talk about the Negroni. And she's like, why her? The Negroni's from Mi- Milan. And I was like, what? So let's just, let's get the story straight. Okay. So just for, for again, for those of you know, who are listening or they haven't, you know, met my blog or anything. So in addition to, you know, having studied Italian formally, Um, I also minored in food studies and um, I completed a certificate in food and wine pairing and I uh, obtained my sommelier certification in Florence. So I do have a little bit of technical background to to drink. So uh, in addition to like the cultural aspects of it. So I think the reason why your friend, so this is my qualification at least, you know, and, and that sense. The other sense is that I lived in Florence, you know, for almost a decade now. And um, the drink is definitely thought to have been born in Florence, but it was born from a cocktail or from a drink that is born in Milan. And Milan is thought to have the aperitivo culture um, or you know, that claim to fame. So I think this is where some of the confusion gets. And Italians, as you know, are very proud and they, like they're, if they're from a particular city, they invented everything. <laughs> like, you know, don't talk about gelato. Like, if I get, in, I get in arguments with people about like that. Uh, you know, Florence was the birthplace of gelato, and they're like, oh, no, it's in my town. So, I don't know. <laughs> does, does that answer your question? And that answers my question, but I'm, I want to know a little bit more specific because, like, what do you? So, sure. I know, I know, in Milan, what was it? The was it the Americano or was it the Milano Torino that was like that? That was the predecessor to the Negroni. Yeah. So. Basically, the Milano Torino, which is a, a cocktail of, you know, um, vermouth, which was, you know, born in Turin. And vermouth is an aromatized, aromatized wine, basically with, um, with herbs and spices. Uh, and that was a, a way of uh, preserving the wine. But also it was, it was thought to have curative properties like the subtle stomachs. Um, and then uh, bitter, uh, which, you know, gets confused a lot because in the U.S. we, we say like bar bitters and bitters and Um, it's conflated, I think a lot with like Angostura bitters, but like Campari is considered a bitter to like the Italian drink, you know, repertoire. So if you say bitter, you're talking about a a Campari like product. If you're talking about Angostura bitters, you're talking about bar bitters and that's a distinction. So, so Campari was born in Milan. And so there was a cocktail that was Milano Turino that was, you know, equal parts of, you know, each of those ingredients. Then, and, um, then the Americano was this with a dash of sparkling water. And so uh, it was thought that, um, you know, this was a drink that could be consumed in excess because it was very light. It didn't have a high alcohol content um, because it was a bit of each plus a sparkling water. So it was like a really refreshing um, aperitif, but that didn't really get you tanked. So then um, there was this, you know, I'm kind of going now into the, 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 you know, the history of the Negroni. Uh, if that's okay, unless you have, do you have any no, I No, I really, I, I want to go into that history. Let's do it. So then <laughs> there was a count, you know, of course there's a count. Like there's a queen that, you know, invented gelato. Kind of, there's always like someone really noble that invented these like crucial, you know, cornerstones of, <laughs> of Italian food and drink, especially in Florence. Um, and there's a count, uh, Camilo Negroni, that had a taste for gin and, you know, he frequented his, you know, uh, his bars and there was one bar called Cafe Cazzoni and he asked them to, you know, asked him to add a little bit of, of gin, uh, you know, here and there. And then um, it got known, you know, uh, in his circles as like the Negroni because he was the only one that asked for, and that was in 1919. So I'm just going to butt myself into the story because uh, when I lived in Venice, um, I used to go to Florian for drinks all the time, but stand mm-hmm. up at the back bar because the back bar was cheaper. And the bartender who has just retired last year, whose birthday is coming up actually, Maurizio, um, he was an excellent bartender, and he too would suggest that he could inv- that that you could customize a drink and and name it after yourself. And I believe I tried something similar to what Count Negroni did, but nobody. No, there's there, there, there's no Firpo, there's no Erika. <laughs> so, so this drink must have been like, you know, 
talmente piacevole for everybody because I mean they really caught on. Is is yeah. is Cafe Cassoni still around in Florence? No, so it was um, bought by uh, uh, Giacosa. So now it's like a bar called Cafe Giacosa. Oh, okay. And it's, um, yeah, so it, I'm not sure exactly what year it got bought. But yeah, I mean, um, now it's owned by Cafe Giacosa. But also another bar that claims to have also served the Negroni for the first time is Rivoire, which is in... Oh, uh, the, one, yeah, the, the, one in the one that faces the piazza, that beautiful one. Exactly. Yeah. And they even have a plaque inside that says like, you know, you know, Count Negroni came here and this was one of the, like, this was the first place where the Negroni was concocted and served. And, you know, so, uh, so Revoir and uh, Cafe Giocosa take, or I'm sorry, Cafe Cazzoni take the, the title. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, something you were telling me when we, before we started recording was that, um, and I said, I, well, you were saying that in, in its, maybe in its infancy, the Negroni also was bottled? Yeah. So um, if you, like, it's kind of interesting now, like, for, you know, for, for pre-batch, right? Because now this is mm -hmm. kind of like a trend uh, where a lot of, you know, a lot of bars are pre-batching and, and selling it. Um, but uh, apparently um, there was, like, a, a small kind of, um, sector where Negroni was bottled as a cocktail and like called like the old Negroni cocktail and it was sold like by the bottle um, and like by you know um, distilleries uh, it's not really popular now uh, I mean I think yes and no um, to do pre-batch because you know the Italian culture is to kind of just go to the bar and get it um, but there was um, yeah I, I could send you the uh, like the the photo because there's like these old bottles with the Negroni you know label on it um, selling it as like a pre batch bottle. That would be kind of cool to see. I mean, I, I was telling you that there's a, a bar in Rome. It's kind of trendy, and they decided to do. I guess it's like aged pre batch bottles of Negroni that you can actually as a as a patron. And I think it would only work for people who really live in in Italy or come to Italy frequently. Um, you know, like you you get your aged bottle. And so anytime you go to this bar, you can drink out of yours. But see, the thing for me is that I, I like, I like Negronis to a point. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I like better, but, but I like them to a point. And I feel like a, a bottle, like a big, big vat would be too much for me. Um, I, I think like, I, I've always wondered, like you, you were talking earlier about pairing Negronis or eating Negroni with food. What works well with a Negroni aside from like, for me, like a tarallo? <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Um, just to like touch base on like the, the aperitivo culture. Uh, so, and by the way, this, this bottled Negroni was an imitation of like this, this recipe. I think that it, just to go back to that really quick, it was like, um, a, a way because it was kind of like fashionable and so there was distilleries that were trying to imitate it because I knew the name was like was popular but it had nothing uh. to do with the original recipe so um so anywho it was something it was like a sort of a promotion with, with Campari uh, uh so and I'll send that more more to you if you'd like but um and for those who can read Italian I highly recommend uh Negroni cocktail uh, by Luca Picchi, who is a barman in Florence, and he's Florentine, and he wrote a very extensive historical account of the Negroni. Um, Lu Luca and, Picchi is not just a barman; he's kind of like the barman. Is, doesn't he work? Yeah. At, doesn't he work at Gili? Yeah. So he did work at Revoir, and then he now he's working at, at Gili, and that's my favorite. Pl the irony of it all is that that is my favorite place to get a Negroni because, of course, he's there. Even though that wasn't one of the first places where the Negroni was served, he did work at the you know at Revoir, but. Um, so, you, so going back to, so this segues really well because one of the reasons why I love going to, to Gili for uh, a Negroni is because they have the just kind of old school aperitivo snacks, which go really well with the Negroni. And so, you know, the point of the aperitivo um, is to have something bitter um, or high, you know, high acid to kind of stimulate your digestive juices. And we all know that Italians aren't very shy about speaking about digestion and optimizing digestion and eating and drinking around, you know, how to, how to um, get more bang for your digestive buck. And so because Negroni is 
made with such bitter uh, components. So Campari, which is like bitter orange and, and spices and all that, those things are thought to, you know, stimulate digestive flow. And um, aperitivo snacks, uh, like Gili, for example, they'll have like, you know, fried, fried snacks or cheeses or little crostini with, so a lot of high fat, salty foods. And so because of the bitterness and the alcohol kind of work well with like high fat snacks, uh, even though, again, the aperitivo start to stimulate your appetite, you think that by having fatty, salty foods, like you wouldn't be hungry anymore, but it does have that effect of like, okay, I'm ready for like my main meal. Uh, so I would say besides like terali, but like olives, nuts, kind of more denser fat foods, like, you know, like I said, cheeses or, or little fried um, snacks or pizzette sort of thing. You know, I'm, I, I was going to say you sound like an expert, but I know you are an expert because I know you uh, have an aperitivo tour. <laughs> the, so that's, so one of the things like when I, when I moved to Florence, because I, I didn't start doing tours until maybe a couple years after living in Florence, but I wrote a lot of my blog. And so my tours were born from the things that I fell in love with around Florentine food and, and drink culture. Um, and so I just love that, of course, you know, Milan, I, I'll give them that, like they have the, you know, stake to claim for, you know, having invented like aperitivo in terms of like the buffets and all that. Um, but, you know, aperitivo culture is pervasive throughout Italy, especially center in the center north, because a lot of these products that are consumed during aperitivo were born in the center north. Oh, especially the north. But when I say center, I mean like since the Negroni was born in Tuscany or Florence, which is considered central Italy. Uh, so, you know, I just love that it's a way after work, you know, to, to socially gather, um, to have a drink and to have a little snack. And I just love the social aspect of it. Um, and I love the social components of Italian culture in general. And this is just like the cherry on the, on the cake on how beautiful um, Italians are in terms of sociability. And I love that it, food and drink brings them together. And I love, in particular, what I love about Florence is there is such a culture of presentation and um, like, yes. how, you know, like, like it's, it's so curated, the aperitivo. It, we have it in Rome, but it, I, I have not, and, and I, I know in Milan, like they have the aperitivo culture, but it's so, it's particularly beautiful in Florence, in my opinion. I think so too. It's interesting you say that because I think just because of the, you know, more of the noble history and, you know, the, the, the Medici and the, and the courts and all of that, there was just more of a emphasis on, on presentation and refinement and, um, like decadence and, and, you know, with, you have Catania de Medici, you know, who, uh, during the Renaissance, you know, did a lot of cul culinary exchange between France, France and, uh, and Italy. And, you know, you find like these more, I can't explain, but like more dainty, um, expressions of presentation and like pastisserie and all of that. And so probably, uh, and we have a, a great history with historical cafes. Um, yeah. So it's interesting you make that observation. I mean, I focus on, on food and, and culture and enjoyment, but I'm sure that um, like, so a lot of the, t the tours that we conduct are led, not just by me, but a team of guides. And one of our guides is a food historian and I'm sure she could go into great depth about you know the arrangements of, of feasts and food and drink and how that ties into Renaissance history. And that's kind of like one of the topics that we do discuss during like our online experiences that we're offering right now is like how you know how food and and meals were prepared and presented during the Renaissance. Well, you know, one of the things I did see in your online tours, your virtual experiences, hold on a second, I gotta pop over to it because I just I like I bookmarked it. Um, the, the Caterina de' Medici, the royal food and her food legacy. And, yeah. and it's so funny because when you, you know, in France, every now and then they'll be like, no, she did not make our cuisine. <laughs> she did not bring, you know, she, she is not the, the fundamental basis of French cuisine, which is what Italians think. And I love it because, I mean, I, I, I love, well, I love Caterina de' Medici. So I, that your, your, your experience, I thought, oh, that's very, very cool. I want to check that out. Yeah, I, I like it too because again, it's like it's um, it's legit since again it's led by a food historian. So it's like, hey, you know, that's this is what this the food historian studied, and this is what the accounts say. And there's been several books written on the matter, especially around the fork and gelato and 
Uh, yes, the, and the fork, and, I think I think the fork is one of those like um, those points that that like those make or break points in in France whether whether or not she really did bring it. But we're not going to talk about Catalina de Medici who invented yeah. French cuisine <laughs> <laughs> um, because we're going to get back to because you know when we talk about like the like you were saying this kind of culture and and the, these the delicacies of Florence that like the, the delicate refinement of Florence that pervades in fashion and, you know, in, in lace making, for example, and in pastries and things like that. One of the things that I love about a Negroni is that there are variations. And in particular, my favorite drink that I've loved for many years is the Negroni Spagliato. Oh my God. I knew you were going to say that. You know me too well then. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, 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 I love it, but I'd love for you to tell everybody what it is. Okay, so this is really, this, this is funny because this is, I'm going to tell you a story that dates back to like my super American, um, like days, you know, my first days in Florence. And the odd thing is, is that, you know, I started studying Italian in 2005 and I studied abroad in Rome on a couple occasions, but yet it wasn't until I moved to Florence in 2012 that I discovered like the Negroni for the first time. I'm sure, I wonder if I ever had it, but I really don't remember. I remember having grappa, I remember having wine and all these things, but I never remembered having a Negroni, like when I studied abroad in Rome. Uh, so, so anywho, um, I thought for a you while- know what, You know what, I don't, I don't think there were Negronis in Rome at that time. Ah, uh, okay. Because wait, what, what year were you in Rome? Uh, t- in 2007 and then 2009. Yeah, I don't, I mean, hmm. I mean, the Penitivo culture was probably just burgeoning in Rome at that point. It yeah, was, I do remember that. It was more of an, it was more, an, it was more enoteca, you know what I mean? Oh, I remember going to some bars where we just had, I mean, well, I'm almost, I'm not embarrassed. I mean, I was, you know, I was a young, like, college student, but just like the, the terrible sugary mixed drinks, like a mojito. I mean, I would never, I didn't really have it in my mind about like Italian cocktails at that time. So, I mean, you have like the buffet and then you just get like mojito or whatever. Ugh. Um, and I, I don't think I was, I was a bit of a wine drinker, but I remember that very distinctly, like there was these kind of more, you know, mixed drink uh, culture around the aperitivo thing. But um, I thought it was cool still then so anywho um going back um uh to your to your question is that for the spagliato so my first years in florence or maybe my first year i was convinced that a spagliato was um you know the vermouth the 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 campari or bitter and gin and prosecco and i was like sweet even a bigger bang for my uh my (laughs) alcoholic buck but maybe i just got them at like really you know, divey bars because the real, and I had gotten a conversation with an Italian friend once. So I was like, no, the Spagliato has all of them. That's why it's so great. Cause it's like, you know, it's like four types of booze. Like, no, you, you don't do gin. You just put in the Prosecco. And then I just realized I was going to really divey bars that were just free pouring all of them, you know, <laughs> and like I had the worst hangovers too from them. Have you ever had, have you ever had like a mind eraser or a Long Island iced tea? <laughs> oh Yeah. Oh, God. So you, you were in that, you were thinking in that direction, but yeah. And, and that's what those bars were thinking too. They're like, yeah, okay, this is great. Um, but yes, I, yeah, I, lo- I love the fact that this spagliato, which means, you know, some people say it means broken. Some people say it means, you know, it, 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 spagliato means wrong in Italian. Um, it's just a mistake, you know, like, I mean, it's like the, the mistaken, it's almost like the mistaken Negroni to some degree. Um, and I love, I love the Prosecco in it because I'm not that big of a gin drinker. And, uh-huh. and I think also because, um, the vermouth and gin and Erica might not mix very well, uh. <laughs> but me, Campari and, and, uh, Prosecco, it's totally good to go. Like I, I can last for hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was looking up some other like variations because I, I think now the, the Negroni, what I love about the Negroni is that it's inspired a whole family tree of Negroni. Like there's the white Negroni. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's the Boulard um, which has bourbon, not the kind mm-hmm. of Negroni I would like. I like, I like a white Negroni. I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. There's the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, no. I mean, I'm kind of a bit of a, I mean, I think there can be riffs. But um, I think that unless you're using like gin, unless you're using those three basic ingredients, like I don't, I still don't consider it a Negroni. Once you start adding in dark liquors, it's becoming a different drink of its own. Like calling it a rum Negroni, because the whole point of the Negroni to me, and I'm sorry, I'm getting like a bit like pedantic or passionate about it, but like it's the whole thing was the addition of gin. So unless it has gin 
I mean, okay, you can add like short, you know, some different liqueurs or adding like the, the white vermouth or, or different kind of artisanal bitters or, or whatnot. But um, for me, a Negroni is only a Negroni, even as a, as a riff, um, as long as it has gin in it. But that's just my personal opinion. Okay, so then would you say a Negro Spagliato is absolutely not a Negroni then? Well, I know that's a good question. Yeah, um, you know, one could say that that's why they call it Spagliato. Um, because the whole the premise of it as well is that it was somebody variating like this original cocktail, which was like the Americano, um, with that had something fizzy in it, and then they added gin and says like, oh well, I'm taking out prosecco. I'm sorry, I'm taking out the gin and adding prosecco, so um, I made I made a mistake too. Because they say that like one of the ways it was invented was that somebody uh, grabbed prosecco instead of gin by accident. So ah, I like that. I like that. I I also think that it you know it's probably more in line of the traditional Italian cocktails just because um, you know the spritz you know has the prosecco with the bitter mm. you know, aperol so I mean I I'll give the prosecco a pass in terms of being still classified as a Negroni but that's just me. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I like that you're sticking to your guns here. Now, you mentioned that you like Gili as a place to get a Negroni. Where else do you like to go in Florence for a Negroni? Oh, my God. Okay. Um, Manifatura. I am in love with them. So I have this um, relationship with, with Florence's drink culture in, this, in terms of I love the super classic historical bars. I love them so much. Um, and they're, they so represent, it's a good starting point for someone trying to understand, um, like Florence's food and drink culture and its history. But I love the modern places that are trying to like respect tradition, but totally do something a little bit more, um, like contemporary. So Manifatura is kind of like a, you know, a vintage cocktail bar that opened a few years ago and they're dedicated to only um, like to Italian cocktails, to using Italian products, um, playing Italian you know music, um, you know whether that's contemporary, but usually like kind of old fashioned you know um, vintage music, uh, and it's kind of like even though I'm like Italian by heritage, I wasn't born in Italy, I didn't grow up in Italy, but for me, I feel the nostalgic that Italians feel when they go in there. Because now there's so many, it's such a trend to open these like secret bars and these speakeasy style bars and Italy didn't have prohibition, you know, so all these bars that are opening now in, t in terms of the contemporary bar movement are modeling themselves after, you know, foreign trends, whereas Manifatura is like this very it modern Italian contemporary trend and I love it. I like that. I, I didn't, I, I don't think I've ever been there. Um, you we have did to go. I, well, I, you know, I, I can't wait to drink a Negroni Spagliato with you, even though you don't agree that that's a Negroni. <laughs> no, no, no. I give it a pass. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go to Julie. We're going to go to Manifattore. Is there anything else? And, and then you, is there anywhere else you said you would, you would go? I mean, Revoir for sure. I like Revoir, but um, there's something, if I had to pick my two favorite places, because be when, Luki, when Luca is behind the bar, it is, um, it is a special experience. And especially if he knows that you know who he, not that, I hate to say it like that, not because you know who we know he is, but because he really appreciates um, like aficionados, I guess you could say, or someone who's enthusiastic um, because he's so you know geeky on the matter. So if somebody comes to the bar asking for Negroni and he can tell that they really understand it and they came because of him, I mean, he lights up and he, and he makes a perfect cocktail and he's happy to talk about the drink and what he's put into it and maybe like mention a bit of his book he's one of the most genuine bartenders in florence that has a ton of alkalade but isn't you know arrogant or isn't you know um like too full of himself if that makes sense so i like to go there because he if he's there um just because this is someone who charted the history of the negroni and then you go to somewhere that contrasts uh, Manifatura, which is a new place, but people that really respect the history and the legacy of Italian products and Italian cocktail culture. Oh, I think, okay, so we're definitely, I'm definitely going to meet you there. We're going to do that. And, um, and we're going to try, we're going to, you know, we're going to do, we're going to like have a taste test. We're going to do like Negronis and then we're going to do Negronis that you don't like that yeah. are not Negronis. <laughs> Now, I was telling you earlier, I, you know, I, I do, like I said, I love a good Negroni spagliato. Darius, my husband, loves Negronis. Um, I 
completely suck at making them. So that's just not, it's not my wheelhouse. It's not happening at my house. I'm like, if we have to get Negroni, we go out. Is, is, have you ever, have you ever made one at home? Yeah. So, um, well, just to, um, insert another shameless plug. Uh, so in, in addition to the aperitivo tool, we do like a cocktail making class in Florence and a Negroni club, which is like a box of like Negroni ingredients that is sent to people's homes with like all the tools because the trick, it's a very simple cocktail to make because if you think about it, it's like three part, you know, it's equal parts of these three ingredients, but there's a few things that you need in order to make it extremely well. And that is like the proper tool. So you need like a mixing glass, you need, you know, a good ice and you need um, to make sure that there's a proper amount of dilution and you need like the, the right ingredients because now it's also, you could, if you're starting out, you could just do, you know, beef eater, uh, Campari, and then, um, uh, what is it? Um, uh, Antica Formula Vermouth, which is one of like the oldest uh, recipes of vermouth, which uh, is still being bottled and it comes from Turin. You can start with that, get a mixing glass, good ice, make sure that it dilutes about 15%. Um, so that's kind of hard to measure. You just kind of have to, if you stir and stir for, I don't know, five minutes, you'll probably get enough of that dilution. And then you strain it into a glass with ice. And, and then like put an orange twist, make sure that you twist the orange over the drink so it gets some of like the, the oils from the orange. Um, but the, so now that's the basic one, which you can get those products anywhere. But I really love um, artisanal kind of um, micro batched um, uh, liqueurs and spirits. And I'm very, um, I'm very into uh, Tuscan made gin because Tuscany grows tons of juniper. So it only makes sense to make gin um, in Tuscany. And I like- Oh, know, I like that. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't, and, I didn't and, even think about that. It's, I mean, ah, so I could like, I hope, I'm sorry that I'm like talking so, so much, but I love that yet yeah, the plethora of artisanal craft ingredients in Italy um, is immense, but it's hard to get them abroad. So this is why I developed like the Negroni Club. Uh, and, and so then I like really craft, you know, boutique vermouths, being a sommelier, of course, like I'm very passionate about the wine product. And then the Campari, I mean, Campari is fine. It's just an industrial product and it's got a lot of sugar and artificial flavors and colorings. Um, it still has some of the herbs and spices, but I prefer like the more artisanal versions of bitter. But because this has become a trend and especially in, in drinking cities like San Francisco or Seattle or New York, People are like obsessed with like artisanal vermouth and artisanal bitters, but you know, you can't just mix any one of them. You have to know which products to select because, um, you know, a Tuscan made gin, it's very distinct and you need a particular vermouth to go with that and a particular bitter. Um, and so I, um, I worked with one of Florence's most like, you know, renowned barmen to develop the, the Negroni club to like, you know, handpick these bottles, which are very like, Sim, like harmonious in terms of pairing. All right, I'm clicking over to the Negroni Club. So hold on a second, because I just happen to have my computer right in front of me. <laughs> um, and I just want to take a quick look, because I want to see what's in this club. Um, because like I said, I, I need to learn these things. Um, okay, so the artisanal vermouth, the Tuscan made gin. I mean, this is beautiful. The recipe to the perfect Negroni developed by Julian Biondi and all the tools needed. I mean, that, sound, that sounds pretty cool. I, I, um, I don't really know if, if I would successfully make one, but I do know that you do have your virtual classes for Negroni. So I could actually do that as well. And that is a shameful plug, shameful plug <laughs> <laughs> right there that you have these great virtual classes. So if you're not in Florence, you can do it at your home and mess up a million times and nobody has to know. <laughs> well, and then also to the, the club includes, includes a class. Um, I mean, the tickets of this class too. So then you'll get to learn how to use all the things in your, in your box. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to as well in terms of trial and error at home, it comes down to personal taste. I mean, so you make them, you know, until you figure out how you like them. Cause I think dilution is like a key that people don't realize because it's very, they're very strong ingredients. And if you don't have a little bit of dilution, it's not as smooth, if that makes sense. No, I, I, and I think to be honest, that's why I let the experts do it for me. 
I also, I also think there's nothing like, you know, I, th- I think a great, like one of the things I've noticed about my favorite bartenders is their hands. They're like, they're like pianists. They have incredibly beautiful hands, like long hands and they, and they move them like, you know, it's, it's an art, you know, and I, I love it. Not just, you know, my, my younger daughter always like, she loves when I bring out the shaker. Cause she's like, that's a sign of a really cool bartender. Ah. And I'm like, that's like from the movie cocktail, but uh, okay. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've noticed like my, one of my favorite bartenders in Rome is Patrick Pistolesi. And if you ever watch him in action, it's like, he, I feel like he's painting. Hmm. What uh, um, bar is he at? He, so it's funny. You were, Cause I was going to say, when you come to Rome, I want to introduce you to him. He has his own bar. It's called drink Kong. And I actually did a great podcast with him because he talked all about like his rise from being behind like a really sticky, skanky, you know, plastic cup pistachio bar to becoming, you know, one of Italy's best bartenders. And then he opened up his own bar called Drink Kong, which um, is not like Manifatura and it's definitely not a speakeasy. It's like, it's like Blade Runner. It's super cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when you come to Rome, I'll take you there. Actually, there are a bunch of really great bartenders in Rome that I, we, when, so when you come to Rome, I'll take you on my version of the Negroni tour, which will be about, it's really about watching these guys' hands, their hands. So, we'll, I mean, it's about the drinks too, <laughs> but it's not about the space. It's about like the magic behind the, behind the hands. Wow. I definitely, oh my God, I love Rome's cocktail scene too. So we'll have to do an exchange. We'll do an exchange. We'll, we'll critique, you know, because ah. I, I think, I think there's, you know, there's something to be said, at least for me about like the, you know, going to like an incredible, beautiful, kind of very cultured space and having a great drink. I love that. And then there is something about like a tiny little posticino that has this like a good quality, excellent bartender who truly loves what he's doing and has the time to talk to you. You know, like there's. Some- I agree. So there's, there's so many different ways to play it, I guess. Um, I totally well, agree. Well, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really happy that we had a chance to talk again. <laughs> um, I have a little secret. Coral and I did another podcast, and we're going to do it on site. I'm not going to tell you what it's about, but um, I threw that one in the can for a variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm so happy, Coral, that you took the time out to speak with me about Negronis. Um, I'd love for you to tell everybody how they can find you, where they can find you, and what they can do with you and Curious Appetite. Sure. So, dun, dun, dun. Uh, you can find me um, probably first and foremost uh, through my website. So my website is CuriousAppetiteTravel.com, and that's where the information for our online events and experiences are in classes uh, as well as information to our our gourmet club which includes information to the Negroni club I'm also super active on social media um, haven't quite yet got on TikTok but I'm definitely on Instagram uh, and I'm the <laughs> one who manages the Instagram account so people you know if it's easier to message me on Instagram um, feel free to I'm happy to send you information about either the club or the online experiences and then um, if you what's, to- what's the Instagram? Could you repeat that? Oh, I'm sorry. Curious Appetite. Curious Appetite. And the website is curious appetite, curiousappetitetravel.com. Correct. Yeah. And um, that also has a link to my blog and all of that. And yeah, and then that includes links to my writings as well. Um, I've, I've written guides um, like, you know, the best, you know, cocktail bars in Florence for like Eater and Condé Nast. So that, you know, there's clips there too because Clearly, I'm super obsessed with cocktails um, in Florence, specifically. Which is which is why when you very you know you, you casually mentioned earlier, you do have a little bit of the academic papers to to back up your your, your fervent <laughs> decisions and 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 passion for for the Negroni. But yeah, I mean, you've written a lot and uh, and you do a lot of research, which is what I really love. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're. And this is coming from you, which I take as a high compliment because I I consider you a very uh, high quality professional journalist. So I appreciate that from you. But I, I think if anything, I'm just really a pain in the ass when it comes to research. <laughs> so so that, 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 that's, that's how I sum it up. Well, it was great speaking to you and I can't wait to see you in Italy. Likewise. Chin chin. Salute. Chin, chin chin. Until then, ciao bella. Ciao. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Ciao Bella. If you'd like to know more about today's guest, please visit ciaobella.co and click on the podcast link or go directly to ciaobella.co backslash podcast. Want more Italy? 
you can find all my episodes on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher. When you have time, subscribe to iTunes and rate the podcast. What are you waiting for? And if you want to be part of the podcast, email me or DM me your Italy questions. To learn more about me and my work, go to my website, ericafirpo.com, and follow my Italy adventures on Instagram at ericafirpo. Ciao, bella! And a very big thank you and hug to Massimiliano Yonta and Dis to Dis Studios, the producers of Ciao Bella, who continue to make me sound and feel great. <laughs> <laughs>